Hello and welcome back to another episode of Critical Reactions with your host Brian. We're going to continue on with this week's theme of drumming up support. Just a fun little pun to use the word drum in the theme because we are looking at drum focused tracks. Hopefully in search of some really cool stuff which this week has presented some fantastic drum work. We're going to be pushing forward with some Rosetta. The track is Ryu Tradition, which is an interesting name for a song. Let's dive into it, see what's going on with Rosetta today. So we have a 10 beat phrase, probably 5 4, but it feels like 4 and 6 to me. I don't know, it kind of alternates. I feel 4 6 sometimes, 6 4 other times, and 5 5. It's interesting. Lots of really great ghost note usage on the drums. Oh, those toms are interesting. They're very uh, round, not punchy. Awesome. Some waviness on the outsides. bass giving us minimal movement but some interesting stuff down there as far as harmony against the guitar I don't think I noticed the decay on the outside so it's like an echo Minimal use of dynamics, but it's certainly not a flat static song either. Production here is rather unique. Yeah, the snare accent pattern is getting very interesting. It's interesting because some of the chords feel optimistic and others drag that down.
there's definitely some heavier dynamics. whole drum production here is kind of wild. Very boomy with the lower end stuff. But the snare is kind of warbly, like there's a light phaser touch on it. It's interesting too, moving from something so large as the last two sections to exceptionally sparse here. Bringing back that same snare pattern from the last big section. Without all of these uh, ghost note fills between them, though, just the accented hits. So the band really emphasizes that one, four, five. Oh. So we're still using some of the sound effects stuff, the ornamental ideas from the quiet section, like that with these space sounds. Weightlessness, driving. Weightlessness, driving. Oh, so we've broken up the driving section now.
symbols bringing in a polyrhythmic idea here at the end. So that's what it's been, okay. All right, so yeah, they're at the end. Because what I, what I had been feeling that entire song in, especially after... I guess minute six when we brought in the final slow burn, the final build up, was uh, this sort of a syncopated idea of emphasizing beat one, the end of two, and then four and five. So you have bum, 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 and that's that that lifting up into the drive, that dun dun dum, that kind of pushes forward, and then we have this this lifting up again, this blooming feeling. And that's created by having a beat every one and a half, or having an accent every one and a half beats. So you have one, and then the and of two, and then 2.5, if you want to look at it that way, plus 1.5 is four. So we have one, the end of two, four, and then there's this extra beat because we're in five, four, and they emphasize that as well, which gives us that four, five, one. So we have this, this strong momentum there. But another way that I didn't even think about interpreting this was in eighth notes, which is what they did at the end when the symbols were giving us that faster da 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 that rapid um, constant attack. And that's when I realized that this the idea of every one and a half beats is kind of abstract, but actually when we look at it this way, it gives us groupings of three, three, four. And that's what the entire song has been done in. Groupings of three, three, four is just on a faster level than I wanted to engage with it because most of this song is kind of sparse when you remove most of the auxiliary ideas. Particularly, I think, moving or removing the ghost notes between the snare accents um, in the back half of the song, which is where we kind of were presented this... Um, is spacier not not like not like space but like there's more room in the song uh, because we're only getting these accents on the one the end of two the four and the five um, and so i, I kind of get into that open slower groove but yeah when you bump it up to eighth notes three three four that's what the entire song is felt in where the four tends to be a bit drivier even there at the end uh, we were seeing um, the accent at the beginning of the first three, the accent at the beginning of the second three, and then the last four, we had eighth notes. We have dot, 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 dot. We have four hits in the span of those two beats. This, uh, this drives the uh, concept of forward momentum in those last two beats even more than previously when we just had quarter notes, the hit on four and then five, those two of them. And that's what creates a lot of the flow in this song because the five is kind of five's a weird time signature it's tough to i think really make it flow well honestly five typically gets broken up into a grouping of three and two which gives us slow at the beginning and speed at the end or two and three which gives us speed at the beginning and slower at the end but if you break it up into ten so here's the interesting thing. They have an even amount of notes now. You can cut that in the middle and have groups of five as long as you stick with the eighth note pulse. They chose to go for three, three, four, though, which creates a general feel and then makes it feel like we have one extra beat at the end. So we have a pulse of three, a pulse of three, a pulse of three, and then an extra hit. Um, and they actually lean into that sometimes. Some of the more esoteric rhythmic elements are where the drummer is playing that and of five into one. 
So they do get playful with that, but there at the end showcases a very clear 334, and that is what a majority of the song is based around. The one, the end of two, and the four and the five collective. I'm glad they did that at the end, because I think I would have missed that entirely. Like I said, I was right on the cusp of understanding that, but in a different lens that I don't think made as much sense. All right. This song, to me, is laid out in two different sections. Now, granted, these sections do a lot of exploration and evolution and modification. They're not static. It's not like we have, on average, five minutes of this and then five minutes of that. But um, I do kind of see it in these two modes, where one is a bit more complex than the other. We start off the song with, I think, the most complex drum idea we have in here. There's some counterpoint, not counterpoint, that's harmony. What's the rhythmic one? Polyrhythm. We have polyrhythmic ideas within the drums itself. It's also introducing this 5-4 rhythm that they kind of don't use the traditional groupings of 3 and 2 on. So that creates its own complexity to it. The guitars and bass are not necessarily rhythmically in line with the drums, which give us another layer of rhythmic complexity to this. Um, and then we also have a bunch of ghost notes on the snare, creating this soft rumble underneath the entire song. It's, it's already a rather complex track rhythmically. It took me quite some time to get into it. In fact, it took me a few bars to even figure out we were in five, which usually I can pick up time signatures rather quickly, especially something like five. But it's, again, because they use a, a, a non-regular, non-usual, a-regular? What is that word? An unusual <laughs> pulse for a five-four. It's not completely out there. It's just not one of the traditional ones. And so I couldn't pick up on that as quickly, but there's also just a lot of metric information going on between all the informations, and it creates something that's rather dense rhythmically. So that's how the song starts off. It's rather low and quiet. It does have rising intensity, mostly in volume, but also a little bit in layering, and that also gets backed off a little bit over time. Again, as I mentioned uh, during the reaction, there's not a lot of dynamic work here, but there's enough that it's it's subtle enough where you can feel it but not that it dominates the song we do eventually hit a peak and then bring it down that's the beginning of the b section we'll get to that in a second but for the most part there's just this small amount of movement that allows the song to feel dynamic without drastically changing what it's going for um there's some volume stuff in here too. We're not at full volume all the time, but we are at near full volume, which allows the song to feel large and big uh, a majority of the track. However, it also allows us to hit a peak later on in the song, which I think is really genius. They even hint at this a couple of times. It might not be something you hear because I honestly didn't hear it, but looking at the volume meter, we did max out the volume a couple of times within that first uh, you know, two or three minutes. Uh, there's a little bit of a, a notion. This is the ceiling of the song. This is how loud we're going to get, but we're not there yet. A little bit of a Chekhov's volume. <laughs> that was dumb. Uh, so, yeah. We, we eventually add more layers to this. The guitars end up doing more things. I think there's two guitar parts at one time, uh, or maybe just double tracking with some harmony. I don't know. The bass continues to do whatever it wants to do sometimes it's just playing uh pedal tone with a passing tone on the fifth beat which i thought was always interesting they like to work with four bar or sorry four beat phrases It'd be like bomb 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 and normally the next beat would be beat one you go to the next note but there's this fifth beat in there and so the bass just kind of awkwardly sneaks a transition note in there You're like bah, 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 bah. it's like it doesn't really work. The song isn't really pushing for these transition uh, notes either. It just it always felt awkward to me. Sometimes they would come in under. Sometimes they'd overshoot and drop back down. I think generally it works to add a little bit of more movement and complexity to the melodic element to the song. 
But uh, there are many times when I just questioned why not stick with that brute tone for one more beat, which the bass does also do a couple of times. I never really found any pattern to when they would use passing tones or not. Uh, it's not really anything detrimental, and I'm sure most of you never even noticed it, but it continued to pop up in my ear and be like, oh, that was an interesting passing tone. And that's, I think that's the thing, too. Passing tones work in general. We even have a term for it, so obviously it's something you know, commonly used, but it's just the note selections in here were a bit uh, awkward at times. And that's compared to what everyone else was playing, I think, primarily. Which uh, kind of brings up another thing. The tonality in this opening section is kind of wild. We do get to, after building up a few ideas and expanding things, vocals come in. And this is where things get a little wild. First of all, the vocals are pushed out to the side. We don't have a center channel vocal. But I don't think that they're double-tracked in the traditional sense. If they are, this dude is immaculate with his timing and enunciation. Everything is perfect. What it sounds like to me, it was recorded once and then just separated and pushed hard out to either side. It's the same recording, though. Um, and this creates a, a very interesting gap in the middle of the song because the guitars are also side-panned, which gives us the drums and the bass in the center and... Mm, I don't know if that really carries enough that allows this weight to be pushed out to the outsides. It never ends up destroying the song in any way. It's just It took me a second to get adjusted to that. It was one of the things I mentioned, or one of the things I felt when I originally mentioned, oh, you know, the production in this is kind of strange. Uh, the, the decision to push all the important things, I would say, out to the sides and leave just the rhythm in the middle it was intriguing. It was a little different. But the other thing of interest here is one of the guitars is just very noisy. It's the right pan one. And it's just kind of choosing notes at random. Sometimes it's harmonious with what the left guitar is doing. Sometimes it's dissonant with what the guitar is doing. And there doesn't really seem to be, again, any pattern to it. It's not like one bar is consonant and one bar is dissonant. And honestly, this guitar over here doesn't really change its note very often either. It just kind of pedal toned its way into a drone. And so it's it's this guitar, technically, that is sometimes more in line with that single note and sometimes less aligned with it. And I find that to be interesting. Because it kind of mirrors something we would see in the next section when the two guitars decide to link up harmonically and we end up having all consonant chords where half of them are a bit more uplifting and positive and the other half are a bit more dragging down and heavier and more moodier i don't uh i don't quite know what the song is about atmospherically it's just kind of heavy and rhythmically disjointed in a positive way. Usually I say disjointed in a negative way, but the, the groove in here is just wild. I don't, I don't think this is a song you can easily just bob your head to unless you're really feeling that 3-3-4, three, three, but even then you have that extra that extra burst at the end of the 4 that uh, makes it a or asymmetric. So it's, it's rhythmically a, it's a wild track. And so having this this duality in the harmony too just sort of adds to some of that uh, ambiguity i guess that the rhythm already leans into where parts are clear it's just how it comes together is a bit hidden but that pretty much wraps up the a section we started from a medium volume and rose up to pretty peak there the B section is sort of the same thing all over again. We start quiet, we bring in some of that snare roll, uh, the ghost notes on the snare again. Uh, we bring back a... well, we don't bring it back. We continue to de-evolve the rhythm. 
uh, we remove some of those ghost notes. Not all of them, but a little bit to create more space in here. Eventually, we're going to remove them completely and focus on just the accented snare hits. Uh, we never hear any of that dissonant guitar harmony ever again. Uh, we don't really hear much guitar har harmony at all. The guitar is single noted throughout this uh, rest of the run. The bass simplifies their sound even more, removing some of those more exploratory sounds and sticking with just a pedal tone throughout. Um, and we begin to build things up again. There are some interesting sci-fi, spacey, phasery, bleepy, bloopy kind of sounds coming in at this point, sparsely used once every other bar or so, uh, just kind of popping up seemingly random. I think part of that is just the awkward time signature of all this. I never really got into a groove with the five, so I would normally feel out that pulsing of three and just kind of expect the three to, to exist. And then it doesn't when that four comes in it kind of throws me off a little bit so the uh the bleepy bloopy stuff uh seemed to come in at random times for me i never really caught a pattern onto that and that's a general theme here isn't it a lot of rhythmic patterns i just never really caught on to with this one um but yeah so we have these uh, these spacey sounds coming in. They're helping build this atmosphere up. Eventually, the guitars get larger, the drums get louder, the vocals come in, um, and the sounds persist. But we have well, they're allowed to persist because we have more space. The guitars are playing less notes. The drums are playing less notes. The bass is still playing quarter notes. Nothing changed there. Um, but having this extra space allows these ornamental ideas room to exist. What's interesting then is that towards the 75% mark, they are pulled back as well, and we're just left with this more spacious playing. All of the instruments are playing the most simplified version of their riffs so far, and uh, the song just sort of runs out to the end, getting larger and louder and simpler until we just hit the end of the song, and they hit a final note, and that's it. There's no grand harmonic movement there's no chord progression that says finality nothing like that the song just stops playing and so on one hand i kind of found this song to be a little boring i don't like to use the b word around here but i did find my mind kind of wandering off at times as there is general movement to the song it's just very nuanced very little there's a lot of time spent in an atmosphere minor movement to that atmosphere but primarily just sitting in that sound for multiple minutes at a time and especially since the back half of the song doesn't the song doesn't build up into its most complex it kind of de-evolves into its least complex and most loud and, and aggressive almost so i definitely found like i said my mind wandering a bit towards the end of the track but i i want that to be a subjective opinion on it not some sort of objective truth about the song not that i think any song can be objectively boring but that it kind of works in reverse. It grabs your interest immediately and then allows your mind to wander. Usually a song will start out simpler and build into its most complex. So I find that to be interesting. And I wonder if there's anything in the lyrics that might mirror that. There's also some really cool ideas in here. Again, sort of on a more nuanced side of things that allow the song to continuously feel like it's going someplace, even though it kind of never really does it's those nuanced movements it's the small changes and things it is at the end of the day though post metal very focused on wall of sound atmosphere i think a bit more nuanced than some post metal we've listened to but the vocals also lean into that textural element where it's not so much about pitch as much as the texture of the atmosphere the the emotion of it all and so you know, it's definitely a part of me that I can't really hear this with the melodic lead on top of it, but uh, the 
harsh vocals didn't really do much for me anyways and oftentimes they kind of got stuck into the mix anyway so they were more of a white noise for me than any sort of lead component and uh now come to think of it there really isn't much of a lead on this everything is harmonic no everything is foundational everything is designed to either provide the harmony for the emotional weight of the atmosphere or the texture of the atmosphere uh, Although there's also the rhythmic component to that, but after you get past some of the complexities in the rhythm, especially in the back half, when we start to remove them naturally rather than having to hear past them, you find that the rhythm's pretty straightforward too. So it's um it's not my cup of tea, but I appreciate what they're doing, and I think that uh, a song like this showcases that Rosetta's doing something a little bit different than their contemporaries and I think it elevates them a little bit because most post metal tracks don't give me 20 minutes of something to talk about I'm like oh yeah there's noise wall of sound there's some texture and some screaming you got a song <laughs> but there's a lot of nuance to this and I, I think it uh, it definitely shows that they are a cut above the rest let me dive into some lyrics on this and we're going to wrap this video up all right Getting something a little cryptic here. I thought maybe that this might be a part of a concept album. So I went and looked and kind of surprised there's only seven tracks on the album. They all follow this format of having, I believe, one Japanese word and then one English word. Um, with this track being Ryu and Tradition. But... Aside from that, this is the opening track, so there's no prior context to get with this, which makes the cryptic element even more intriguing. It makes me think it's some sort of foreshadowing that maybe would make more sense with context, possibly context from the rest of the album. I have zero annotations from Genius on this, though, so absolutely zero help. I'm just going to read it. It's rather short, but... Um, it is enthralling. I don't know if it's the language. I don't know if it's the use of repetition in some places with words specifically being repeated throughout. Uh, there's a concept of forgiveness and silence and atonement used throughout this entire thing. But we are only looking at, I don't know, maybe 18 lines. Let me read this real quick. It says, indulge securely this apology where silence is salient where silence is still indulge this offering forgive my silence embrace the atonement embrace the silent embrace the outpour vacate the angst atone and sing confess and rest your sweetly wings sometimes i think that these stars are calling me back calling me home Please accept this small offering, the dim light of God's. Come now and rest, come rest well. Sometimes I think these stars are fireflies of home calling me. In the silence, all atone, collapse, embrace. It is evocative poetry. I don't know what it means, but I can feel it. And that's not always something that happens in the world of modern lyrics. You know, I think rock and, and metal kind of lean more towards uh, non-poetic poetry, stuff that's a little less flowery. But even this, it's not really full of metaphor. Um, I don't think there's anything too figurative in this either. A couple of lines, sure, rest your sweetly wings, probably not, not talking about real wings. But uh, there's something powerful about these collections of words that I just don't get too often. I've listened to a lot of rock and metal over the last... I've listened to a lot of music in general over the last five years, and I could probably count on both of my hands the number of times I have felt moved by words when I don't know what the words are saying there's just something about the collection of the words of the the sounds the syllables in this order and I don't think it's too much about the delivery either actually I think the delivery of these lines is uh, a weak point 
for me. I'm not a big fan of that vocal style. I don't connect with it very much. But I do think there's something interesting about reading all of this with a static delivery. There's no ups and downs. There's no rising intensity and falling intensity. It is just the harsh vocal. Same delivery, same intensity, same texture the entire time. And it makes it almost feel like something of a prayer, almost. A little disconnected, possibly. And I think that adds another layer of intrigue to it. These are my thoughts. Rosetta's Ryu Tradition. Let me know what you thought of this song. If there's anything that stood out to you, anything that you would like to add on to what I said or correct me on, maybe you have your own thoughts, opinions, and perspective on this song. Let me know. Put all that stuff down in the comment section. Above that, in the description box, you'll find a link to Linktree. It takes you here. You can find links to my music, ways to support the channel, a link to the Discord server, and so much more. Above that, if you could, like, subscribe, and ring the bell. I greatly appreciate all three of those. That wraps it up for this one. I'll be back tomorrow, 5 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, 10 p.m. UTC as usual. We're going to wrap up and finalize this week's theme of focusing on excellent drums. Until next time, remember to be critical, not cynical, of the music you listen to and have a fantastic morning, afternoon, or evening whenever you choose to watch my videos. Mm -hmm.